The rain came about 11. Derek had time for one quick joke. You said it would be six and a half hours. That's almost seven. Then it hit him and there was nothing but water. The clouds had come quickly, covering the stars and moon in what seemed like minutes, and then just opened up and dropped everything on them. It wasn't just a rain, it was a roaring, ripping downpour of water that almost drove them into the ground. They had moved back into the lean-to to try to get some rest since the mosquitoes partially lessened, but the temporary roof did nothing, absolutely nothing to slow the water. They were immediately soaked, then more soaked, sloppy with water. They tried moving beneath some overhanging, thick willows and birch near the edge of the lake, but the trees also did nothing to slow the downpour, and finally they just sat, huddled beneath the willows, and took it. I have... Brian thought, always been wet. Always. Even my soul is wet. He felt the water running down his back. He judged it to be about the same rate as a faucet in a kitchen sink at home, and it made him think of his mother, sitting at the table, the dining room table, with a roof. He'd forgotten how nice a roof could be. This is crazy, he said aloud to Derek next to him. But the rain took the words away, and he leaned against a birch and closed his eyes and finally took it. I'm here, he thought, to show Derek how I did it, how this can be done for other people, and right now there is nothing to do but take it. And somehow, the night passed. Close to dawn, the rain stopped, and there was a softness after the rain, almost warmth, and that brought the mosquitoes back for one more run. By the time the sun came up, full up over the lake and brought the warmth, Brian felt like he'd been hit by a truck while playing in a puddle. He ached all over, and when he turned to see Brian, Derek, leaned back against a tree sideways, curled into a ball with his jacket still over his head. Brian laughed. The sound awakened Derek, who was not really asleep, and he looked out of the jacket. What's so funny? Brian shook his head. I guess it's not funny, but you look so miserable. You ought to see yourself, Derek grinned, kind of like a drowned rat. That's about how I feel. They stood, and Brian moved down the shore of the lake. He stripped his clothes down to his shorts and wrung them out and hung them on some branches to dry. This day, he thought, this day we must find shelter and a firestone and get a fire going and some food. Hunger was already there. Not the kind that would come later, the cutting kind he remembered so well, and that still made his mouth water when he walked past a grocery store or fast food place. But it was there. We have a problem, Derek said suddenly. He had moved down to the lake shore as well and had stripped down to hang his clothes to dry. That's for sure, Brian said. We've definitely got a problem. No, not what we're doing here. I mean, we have a problem with you. What do you mean? You're so, so quiet. I mean, I see you looking at things and thinking, but I don't know what you're thinking about or what you're working out. I have to know all this to write about it, to tell people what to do. Brian nodded. I understand. It's just that last time I did this, I was alone. I would have killed, Brian thought suddenly, for someone to talk to, someone to share it with, someone to hear me, and now that I have someone, I don't talk. It's kind of strange having someone here with me. Derek nodded. That's what I mean. You have to tell me everything. Externalize it all for me so I can write it. Derek moved back to the lean-to where he'd left the radio in his weatherproof briefcase. Inside the briefcase, he had notebooks each one in a plastic bag, and he took one out now with a pencil and began to write carefully. When he'd written something, he looked up at Brian waiting. All right, I'm ready. Externalize, Brian thought. How do you externalize? Well, I'm thinking now that we should make sure we get shelter today and then get a fire today and get some food today. I sound like a catalog, he thought, like I'm reading a telephone book. Derek nodded and started writing, and Brian thought of what he really wanted to say. We should grab the radio and call for the plane and go home and eat a hamburger and a malt, maybe eight or ten cokes, a steak, some roasts, and pork chops. He shook his head. There, Derek said. What were you thinking there? Brian stared at him and shook his head. You don't want to know. Just junk. He walked away into the day. It was enough. Enough of talk. Enough of externalizing. Another night like last night would kill him. He left his clothes to dry, but wore his tennis shoes and noticed that Derek did the same thing, although he carried the notebooks as well, and Brian set off along the lake shore to the left. Rule one, he thought, don't leave the lake shore or you'll get lost. 
Then he remembered Derek and said it aloud. Thank you, Derek said, rather properly. Standing in his underwear, holding the notebook, he looked exactly like somebody out of an old, funny movie, and Brian had trouble keeping a straight face. That's exactly what I mean by externalizing. We're looking for a firestone, a shelter, and food, all at once. Always. Always you look for food. There, up along the edge of the clearing, you see those stumps? Derek nodded. Those will be a good bet for grub worms later. Grub worms? Sure. Bears eat them. Love to eat them. I can't eat them yet, but by about the third day, if we don't find something else or get some fish, they'll probably be looking pretty good. Grub worms? Brian smiled. I thought you did this survival thing once before. Oh, we ate lizards and snakes and stuff like that. They always have the course in the desert, or did until now. I think it will change. And you always read about people eating ants and grasshoppers, but I never ate a grub worm. You don't chew them, Brian said. I think that would be too much. Just to chew one up, guts and all, they're too soft and, well, just too soft. But if you wrap them in leaves and swallow them whole... Right, Derek nodded and wrote in the notebook, grub worms. Brian stopped and turned to Derek. Food is everything. What do you mean? Just that. Out here, in nature, in the world, food is everything. All the other parts of what we are, what everything is, don't matter without food. I read somewhere that all of what man is... Everything man has always been or will be, all the thoughts and dreams and sex and hate and every little and big thing is dependent on six inches of topsoil and rain when you need it to make a crop grow. Food. You sound like you've thought this out. That's all I did. Think of food. You watch other animals, birds, fish, even down to ants. They all spend all their time working at food, getting something to eat. That's what nature really is, getting food. And when you're out here having to live, you look for food. Food first. Food, food. They moved through the day that way. During mid-morning, they found some raspberries growing in a brush pile. It was not a thick stand. It would maybe have been enough for one person, but with two, it was skimpy. Still, there were some, and they worked through the brush in their underwear, eating every berry they could find. Later, they also found some choke cherries, what Brian had called gut cherries. But Brian shook his head. Later, if we have to, and then in small amounts. Brian kept moving along the lake, waiting, walking, and waiting. And he realized at length what he was waiting for. What was in the back of his mind? Luck. You move and you watch and you work hard, and you just keep doing that until luck comes. If it's bad luck, you ride it out. And if it comes the other way and you have, luck, and you have good luck, you're ready for it. They had good luck in the middle of the afternoon, and as so often seems to happen, the good luck came about because of bad luck.